Welcome everyone to the Art of Science, Art, the Art at BTI Celebrations in Soil webinar. Thanks for your time. Just a few housekeeping um, measures just before we get started. The host will be joining us soon and we'll have the great presentations planned. During the session, all participants are muted, but if you do have a question, you can ask in the chat. Each of the presentations will have a question and answer period at the end and we hope we'll answer, address all of the questions that you have at that time. Good evening, everybody. I'm David Stern, BTI president, as you can see on the slide. I'm uh, dressed down for COVID, like a lot of people who are working at home. Um, feels less formal. I want to welcome you. I wish I could see all of your shining faces. Um, these events are really awesome in person, but we're going to make this one awesome uh, remotely. Uh, so I, as a, I wanted to welcome you to BTI. You've seen the video. Um, we are an exciting research institute and Professional Development Institute for Science on the campus of Cornell. We're independent and we love that, but we love our neighbors at Cornell. And we're always trying to push back the frontiers of science and discover new things. And we hope some of them will make all of our lives better. We've been um, coping with COVID just like everybody else. I was at the Institute today and it seemed a little bit less like the video, a little bit more like empty hallways, but this is already an improvement. People are filtering back in and the research is starting to run again. So we've been through a lot just like everybody else and it's really nice to have an opportunity to celebrate something. And here it's the celebration, both of the intersection uh, between art and science, but also we're celebrating National Soil Health Day. Now you may not know this, but back in 2008, the uh, United States Senate passed something bipartisan by unanimous consent and it was a resolution recognizing soil as an essential natural resource and soil professionals as playing critical roles in managing the nation's soil resources. And the Senate's resolution pointed out that soil, plant, animal, and human health are intricately linked, that soils are dynamic, that soils are easy to destroy and hard to regenerate, that they're important for water, they're important for climate change, agriculture, rural development, and that we really ought to manage our soils better and we ought to have better public awareness of the importance of soils. Well, that was back in 2008. Um, now it's 2019, last year, and National Soil Health Day was started, recognizing that the Senate had put out a resolution, but nothing had happened as a result. So this is a reminder that um, of the importance of soils, and I think a really, really cool illustration in the art world, but also in the science world, of something that you may not know about soils. So I want you to enjoy the presentations. Now, as we've gone into a, a virtual mode here, uh, we're happy that we have people from outside the area who sometimes wouldn't have joined our prior uh, Art at BTI celebrations. And I'm sure in the future, we'll be looking to welcome people from afar as well as near as we've all begun to get used to this, this uh, quasi virtual world. We see each other sometimes in the screen, sometimes in person. And um, I'm sure that that we're going to see permanent changes in how we interact with this. But the silver lining is really that we can all be together even when we're physically far apart. I want to appreciate, uh, give my appreciation to, to Kirsten Kurtz, who's the artist, and Maria Harrison, who's our BTI faculty member, who's joining us this evening. Uh, they, of course, um, didn't expect and plan to do things virtually, and I especially think that the art part of this uh, is, um, is really a, a big challenge. How do you, how do, you do something remotely that feels like it ought to be very up close and personal. And I'm really looking forward to seeing how Kirsten has arranged her presentation because I didn't want to cheat and see it ahead of time. Um, BTI also has a selection committee that I want to thank. We, uh, we have, there's lots of artists around. BTI is a very crafty community. Um, Jeff and Sandy Bricker, Nancy Ridenauer, George Jander, uh, who's BTI faculty. Mike Carroll at BTI was helping to put on this event. Allie Evans, whose voice, lovely voice you just heard from our advancement department and Stephanie Meyer also who leads advancement. So they've engaged uh, to get um, this lined up, this particular program. And, um, and they have 
uh, made the connections and maintained the connections that allow us again to, to mix art and science. And lastly, I'd like to thank uh, Cayuga Landscape for sponsoring Art at BTI. They've been a sponsors of BTI. David Fernandez is the president of Cayuga Landscape and his wife Elizabeth Lawson are, are important donors and friends of BTI for a long time and they've sponsored Art at BTI for the last several years. Unfortunately, David wasn't able to join us to make remarks tonight, but um, our hearts are out to him for supporting this event and for supporting BTI. And so without any uh, further ado, I'd like to get you into the program, the reason we're all here, and I'm going to turn it over to Ali to introduce our artist. Great. Thanks, David. It's hard to lead in a time of challenge and change, but I think you're doing a great job and your words are motivational this evening as well. Thanks for wonderful remarks. We're grateful for your leadership and we're excited to get started. I would like to turn things over to Kirsten Kurtz, an artist who inspires through the use of soil in her paintings. And David mentioned that these paintings are truly phenomenal when you see them in person and they are hanging at BTI right now. So um, we are going to be amazed by Kirsten as she um, just shares how her, how soil just is, is in the painting. It's an amazing thing. So take it away, Kirsten. All right, thank you guys so much. Um, I really appreciate that introduction. I really have to say first, uh, thank you so much to Ali and to this whole crew for putting this together. It's not easy to have a virtual art show as uh, David mentioned, but I've had a lot of support and I think it's gonna be great. All right, my name is Kirsten Kurtz. I am the manager of the Cornell University Soil Health Lab. Uh, we are the leading soil health testing facility in the world. I am also a graduate student in the Department of Natural Resources at Cornell. I'm working on looking at um, soils in the tall grass prairie region that have never been tilled or cultivated, and I'm looking at those against active ag soil in order to understand um, what modern agriculture has really done to some of the best soils in the world. I'm also an artist. Um, that's what I'm gonna talk about mostly today. I'm gonna try not to get too sciencey and I'm really gonna try to just share my work with you. Um, I have an undergrad in fine art and I've started a soil painting initiative where I'm endeavoring to educate people about the importance of soil through art. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So last year, I was invited to talk to the Tri-Society meeting, which is um, the soil scientists, agronomists, and breeders, I believe. Um, and we all meet together. We met in Texas, and we had this soil art show there. And when they were inviting me to the art show, they referred to me as an artist turned scientist. And although I like that as a concept, I'm really consider myself more of a scientist turned artist, because through becoming a scientist, I became what I would consider a professional artist. I was inspired when I was working in the Cornell Soil Health Laboratory by the colors of the soil. You can see some of them in one of our lab tests. That's our rapid texture analysis here on the left-hand side of the screen. And I was taking a class with this woman named Kim Schrag, who's a really, really amazing painter who lives in Trumansburg. And I really wasn't loving the colors of acrylic paint. So I asked her if it'd be all right for me to try to make my own paint from soil. Um, she said that it was, and then I started kind of my journey on figuring out how I could do that. So I tried a couple different things, including egg whites, which I really do not recommend. Um, and I finally discovered that I could mix uh, dried soil that's been sieved with gesso, which is derived from gypsum um, and water and I'm able to make paints like that. You can see here on the screen what the soil looks like as I prepare it to make it into a paint. And then you can also see here some of the colors that I'm able to uh, create. And what makes me so excited about these colors of soil is that this paint is exactly the same color as that soil would be in the ground, right? And that usually alone really starts to expand people's minds and ask questions perhaps about where those colors came from. 
It is not the neatest of art mediums. It's pretty messy, as you can imagine, and the soil paint is very permanent. So if I get it on anything, it's there forever. But I just wanted to share this picture and kind of show what it looks like um, when we set up for an event. This was at the Johnson Museum on the Cornell campus. And those were my awesome undergrad volunteers um, who were helping me remix the soil before we got started with um, our soil painting event, which I'll show you a little bit more about that later. So these are the first soil paintings that I ever did. Um, this I call my family portrait series, and this is what I did when I was working uh, with Kim Schrag in Trumansburg. I can see um, that I've really grown a lot since this time. I can also see, interestingly enough, the bottom middle picture that is of my mother, and that picture is actually quite close to the techniques that I have now developed. Um, but originally, you can see that I was leaving, you'll see as you see comparisons of what I'm doing now, you can see I was leaving a lot more white space, um, and you can kind of see the canvas in a lot of cases, and that's something that I really don't, doesn't agree with my current aesthetics, and I like to build the layers up really, really thick. So I brought a couple of these paintings with me to World Soil Day 2014, and um, this professor, Johannes Lehman at um, Cornell, who also really cares about art and supports art and communications and between art and science, he really liked my family portrait series and he asked me if I would consider doing a uh, event that involved soil painting on the Cornell University campus for World Soil Day 2015. Um, so you can see here uh, my design, designing the canvas in the lower left um, corner. And then what I did in this case is that I brought that designed canvas with me to the Mann Library lobby and I would say about 50 to 100 different people contributed to painting this painting. So uh, I had very little to do with it. I did do the towers myself, but it was more about creating this event. Um, as part of this event, we created a time-lapse video of um, our interacting with the people and kind of watching the, the painting develop, which is really fun to watch. And this is a really good place for me to talk about collaboration. I talk about collaboration generation all the time. I believe that's what we are. I believe that working together, we can get so much more done than we can if we just focus on ourselves. This video was done by Craig Kramer, who is my colleague at Cornell, communication specialist, and he has had a lot to do with um, my ability to get this art out there, which is incredibly important. So the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization um, saw the video of, from World Soil Day 2015, and they based an international soil painting contest directly on the project that we had done, including with the time-lapse video. Um, when I heard this, I bought soilpainting.com that night. I had a feeling that I might be onto something and I might need to take it a little bit more seriously and they asked us to enter into the contest. So I recruited um, a group of coincidentally women who are also scientists slash artists for most, in most of these cases, um, who you see here on the screen, and they painted with me, and again, we created a time-lapse video, The Three Sisters in Soil. Um, I did wanna include this one picture of it getting photographed, just to give you an idea of the scale of this. Um, and much like Ali said, it is really hard to see what these paintings really look like um, via a screen, but they are hanging on campus. This painting's hanging in the campus entrance to the Bradfield Emerson Complex. Um, we donated it to Cornell, so if you want to see it in person, you can see it there. This painting depicts the three sisters of agriculture, which is corn, beans, and squash. Um, they have been grown together for a very long time by indigenous peoples of this country and other places. And it's really a great example to me of sustainable agriculture and a great example of the type of knowledge that we already had, right? So the way that the corn, beans, and squash concept works, if you're not familiar, is basically uh, the beans fix nitrogen um, for the corn, the corn provides a structure for the beans to come up and then the squash 
kind of creates a cover on the soil. It's very important to have um, your soil covered. But like I said, I'm gonna try not to talk too much about soil health. So my first event actually was a science cabaret. Um, after those two events at Cornell, I decided to kind of take this off of the hill. Um, and that was working with BTI, I believe back then, and some other people. And what I did for this one is that we set up um, a lecture much like this. And I gave the first half of the lecture and then the director of the Cornell Soil Health Lab gave the second half of the lecture while I finished this painting that you see here live. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with the Science Cabaret, but their logo involved a uh, martini glass. So that's, that's where I got my inspiration for this piece and a little bit of a, a cheeky name also. I think it's really important to communicate to everyone, um, not just to each other as scientists. And a lot of young people are really excited about sustainability and really are interested to learn about sustainability. So this one I did at um, the Grassroots Festival here in Trumansburg. And again, I rec uh, recruited a couple other artists slash scientists, actually both of the women on the screen um, on the left that Sylvia and on the right is Patty, did the Three Sisters painting um, with me originally. And then I just wanted to give you guys a chance to see what that painting looks like. The design of this painting was done by my friend Phoebe Aceto, who is actually a well-known tattoo artist. And um, Grassroots bought this from her and then I used it as the basis for the painting to paint live. Um, this other one, Finger Lakes Bounty, this is a little bit of a smaller piece, um, and I did this alone live at the uh, Ithaca Reggae Fest. And at these events, I really have the chance to talk about soil in an informal way, which is what um, makes it so interesting to me, um, because I'm not trying to formally teach. I'm trying to just kind of get those concepts out there. All right, so this one we did last year at Ithaca Reggae Fest, and I did this with Julie Rosa, who's a really well-known local um, painter, and I thought it would be fun to recruit just a pure artist to do it with me. And I do think it's interesting to see here, you can see the picture of us after we finished the painting, you know, at the music festival and as it's drying, right, and the difference between how that looks, and of course, once it actually dries, the colors really darken, there's a lot of interesting things about painting with soil in addition to painting with a textured surface. You're also painting with a material that really changes colors depending on the situation. I did this one at the New York State Fair last year. Um, this was really fun. This is part of a project that I'm doing with New York 4-H and Susan Hoskins, who is at Cornell, and we're using soil painting as a way to educate young people about different soil properties. So for instance, I can talk about the texture of the soil, I can talk about the, uh, the color, how it got the color that it has, I can talk about organic matter, I can start a lot of conversations like this. And again, we made a video and we actually looked back and we counted and I talked to about 300 people this day while I was painting live, which took me some time to learn how to do, but now it doesn't seem to phase me. Um, I also teach soil painting quite formally at the Johnson. Um, as I had showed you guys earlier, these are some pictures from that. This was a really fun experience. Most of these students um, were not ag students. Most of these students weren't art students. There were all sorts of different students um, from across the university and, and it was a late night event. So it made me really happy to see that we had to actually kick people out at the end of the night when they're coming to paint on a Friday night. I mean, how cool is that? I also teach this as part of a class in the Art of Horticulture class at Cornell. Um, I had a picture of this on my first introductory slide, but then I just wanted to give you guys an idea about the kind of work that people are able to produce with soil painting. And it's really fun to just like work with these students. Of course, almost none of them have ever tried soil painting before and they really are able to produce these incredibly beautiful pieces. I also do commissions. Um, 
it's usually word of mouth. People have just kind of come to me and asked me if I would do a painting for them. I don't really advertise. Um, but the one on the left is of my friend's dog, Nora. And that was a really fun painting to do because he is also a really well, well, he's a somewhat well-known artist and we were able to do an art trade which is really one of the coolest things about being an artist is that I've had the opportunity to collect some art that I honestly probably couldn't buy because I can do trades with people. Um, this other painting up here, this was uh, commissioned by a Cornell professor and it's the view from his house in Lansing. And this was a fun one to do because he really wanted it to be all in sepia tones with the exception of those white buildings kind of popping out. So that was an interesting project also. Um, I did this for a local landscaping company, Green Scene, um, and of course I thought it was really fun to do a painting with soil for an agricultural based company. And um, yeah, and this one's quite big. Most of my paintings are pretty big actually. This one's about four, no, probably three foot by two foot. Uh, this is another commission that I did for this church actually down in Pennsylvania, the Moravian Church, and this is their seal. And what was really interesting about this job was that he brought me soil that meant something to him. So they brought me some soil from the basement um, of the church, and then they also brought me this muck soil from New Jersey, which is that really black soil that you see on this screen. And this did kind of start a little uh, stained glass days for me, I have to admit. Um, like I've mentioned, a big part of this work for me is getting um, it out there as far as I can, right? So one way that we do that is um, we make posters. So I've done posters of this Three Sisters, as you see on the screen. We've printed about 500 of these and most of them are gone um, and they're all over the world. I was recently contacted about putting it in a book. I know that many uh, professors use it to teach these concepts. So I think that's great. You know, as much as I can get this out there is better. And then with the Moravian Church, I also made a deal with them where I actually designed a poster for them and then I'm letting them uh, sell it for a not-for-profit. So as I had mentioned earlier, um, we have a lot of these time-lapse videos. And I really recommend checking them out if you think this is interesting. Um, they're on my website. And it's pretty cool to just kind of watch the paintings build up. And just as cool to me is watching the interactions. You know, watching little kids or adults, their faces light up as they realize like, what, that soil? I thought soil was all brown, you know? It's just, it's just fun. Uh, one of my more significant uh, media reaches lately would be meeting Summer Rain Oaks. Uh, she is a very cool person. We've become friends now that we've worked together. And she is an eco supermodel. So that basically means she only models for companies that are eco-conscious. And she has this plant one on me show um, and a lot of subscribers. She's you know kind of an influencer, if you will. Anyway, so she contacted us and she asked if we could do um, a video about her soil results. She, she had a, uh, uh, what is it called, an uh, urban garden in Brooklyn, and she wanted us to look at it for heavy metals and other types of issues like that. And then she asked if she could come up with a report and meet me and have me explain what the results mean, as well as kind of show her around the lab. So we did that, but then through that, she learned about my soil painting work, and she ended up doing a separate short documentary about that also. And that's been great. That's really um, expanded the reach and especially most of her audience, I would say, is kind of houseplant people. But we want houseplant people to care about soil too. Soil matters for all of us. So I think it's really important for me to mention that I also paint for myself. I actually was pretty on the fence about bringing my art um, like mixing my art with my science. At first, I didn't even tell anyone I was an artist for my first couple years at Cornell because I thought um, maybe people would be biased and think that I didn't have an appropriate mind to be a scientist. That's, for the most part, definitely proven to be not true. But at the time, I did have some fears. So I like to do some of these paintings uh, for myself to relieve stress and just 
because I have obviously have an urge to be creative, right? So this one after Artemis, this is um, Artemis was a goddess, you know, in mythology who was very closely associated with deer and fertility and kind of the forest. And this painting to me is about after the fertility is gone. And I'm not trying to be super depressing here, but we've lost a third of the arable soil on the planet. And by that, I mean soil that we can farm. And it's really important that we step up and we start to take care of our soil and treat it like the sacred natural resource that belongs to us all like it is. Uh, this is another uh, piece which I actually kind of messed around with recently and I added this border, this black border to it, which I have mixed feelings about. I don't usually ever go back to paintings, but I really felt like this one was kind of, it was hard to tell that it was two birds. But with this one, I was just thinking about Audubon and I was thinking about like the first scientists and like ecologists you know, who went out to assess um, what our country really was like, you know, and start to document um, the diversity of our country. And that was really my main inspiration behind this one. Um, this one is an interesting one in that I originally painted it with acrylic paint. So it's uh, mixed media, if you will. And you can see on it the blue kind of coming through from the sky. And I think that you can see some of that red paint on her face and sort of by her hands. It's also kind of abstract. I don't really do abstract art, as you can kind of tell. Um, but this one, I just, it was just more of a feeling. I've always been very interested in um, the image of the Virgin of Guadalupe. And it was just kind of something I wanted to explore without really that much meaning. And that's okay. You know, that's part of being an artist is sometimes you just need to get something down on paper. All right, so this is um, one of my most recent works, which I call Resilience. And this I will never sell. It is um, for myself to remember to be strong, um, specifically now as I've been uh, doing grad school full-time and working full-time. And also the soil painting thing is kind of taking off too. So it's been a very busy part of my life. I'm incredibly grateful for this time. I've really been able to do a lot and I'm certainly not gonna stop now. But sometimes you just kind of get this feeling of, of being a little tired, you know, as you're coming towards the end of the degree. But this reminds me every morning um, that I have to stay strong. And then I wanted to share with you guys this painting, this is my most recent painting. I painted this, oh, about two weeks ago. And this is to show my support for the Black Lives Matter um, protests and for the work that's been being done to increase um, diversity and decrease racism in our country. This is extremely important. Um, I haven't done a piece before that had so much of a social justice um, bend to it but I again I felt I really had it had to I had to get it out of me I also was thinking a lot about Banksy um kind of people who are doing like graffiti art things like that as I was doing this I was thinking about protest signs right so this is one of my my only my only painting that only has two colors of soil and this one is really cool to see live um, because it's very very 3D and that that black is that same muck soil from New Jersey very, very dark, and then there's this beautiful um, kind of sparkly mica in the red, in that reddish color. And then I had mentioned, actually I don't know if I exactly mentioned, but I'll mention now. I often, when I have these events, I have a blank canvas so that anyone, especially like kids or people who don't feel comfortable with their artistic skills, can kind of doodle and feel it and experience what it is like to paint with soil. And then typically I'll do something like one of the pieces that I showed you guys that's a lot more detailed and a lot more work. So this is an example of one of the community soil paintings. Um, this was from Reggae Fest a couple years ago. And this is my favorite of all the community paintings because at the very end, I walked away to get a glass of water and I came back and this little girl had written, I love cats. And if you look carefully, you can see it says cats a couple times actually on this painting. 
And she went and she used, you can't quite tell luckily, but she went and she didn't even use soil paint, but it sort of mixed with the soil paint. And I was like, oh my gosh, like how could that happen? And then of course, now I just think it's the cutest thing ever. And I don't leave my paintings unattended. Um, last thing I just want to mention is that I do have a SOP, a standard operating procedure for how I make soil paint. This is on my website. Um, I do ask that people, if they're using it for teaching or whatever, maybe give me a little bit of uh, credit for that. But in general, I am a scientist and I'm interested in sharing my work. Um, and then I have some contact information here. And then with that, I can take questions. Great. Thanks, Kirsten. I just think that the texture is amazing and that mm -hmm. I think the resilience painting is something that is speaking to me right now because of what we're dealing with and going through. And I think, thanks for inspiring us there. We've had two questions come in. One is, are there any particular challenges to preserving soil art over the long term? Yeah, I get asked about that a lot. Um, I had a couple of my paintings I never sealed. So I seal them with a high quality varnish, like a museum level varnish that could be removed if they ever need to be cleaned in the future. Overkill for sure. Um, but I do seal them. And then that really seems to hold it there. But if you think about what I'm creating here, mixing gypsum with soil and water, I'm basically making concrete. <laughs> I really am. It's very, very stable. They don't, I've never seen them fall apart. The three sisters, we framed under glass and we like left some room for it and everything in case it fell down that no one could see because I didn't know then and not a single piece has fallen off. Well, the one that we have hanging in BTI, which you all would have seen tonight, it's just really gorgeous and it, it's just it's just lovely and it's, it's holding up well there. We have another question. Do different colors of soil smell different? That's an interesting question. Well, I have seen soil scientists taste soil to pick up <laughs> on things, which I do not recommend at all. Um, smelling, you know, you can tell if it's anaerobic, <laughs> right? Like if it's, so, you know, we're, I'm managing this really big lab that has thousands and thousands of samples come in. So for instance, we'll get bags of soil that have standing water in them. That smells super bad. I would say like, in general, you dig into the soil. I don't know if I could tell the difference between like a, a really healthy soil and an unhealthy soil from the smell, but maybe somebody could with more experience. Great. I don't know, I guess. <laughs> so here's another question. What are your favorite soil types to paint with and does it make a what does it make a difference to you? Uh, yeah, well, soil types, there's like soil orders. Um, I look for different textures. So I do different things with different kinds of textures. So uh, clays I'll work with. You can see in the Three Sisters painting, for instance, there's a lot of cracking. I did that on purpose with the clays. Um, I've done paintings where I'm like really looking at the sand or I'm really looking for strong aggregates. So I guess that I'm mostly looking and interested in the texture and the color of the soil and not so much um, what the soil type is. I probably, I, I don't know, I've never tried, like I wonder what the soil from my research spots would be like, you know, which is very, very fertile, but it's not pure organic matter like this muck soil that we, that we could see on the screen with the black. Great, so um, how do you sustainably collect soils for your paintings? Yeah, that's a great question. So I have a deal with my lab that um, they let me take all of the waste soil. So we ask for about four cups of soil to do our test. Um, our test is really complicated. It has a lot of physics and biological aspects to it where you need larger amounts of soil. So typically we ask for enough that let's say one of the tests failed, then we need to be able to run it again, right? So always we have extra soil unless something happens. So that soil would typically get dumpstered, things like that. I'm really interested in making um, art in general from sustainable things. So that was really my inspiration to start collecting it. But we made an internal deal. I designed the logo for the lab and I built the website and some things along those lines. So we kind of have a informal agreement that I get the soil for free, it's great. So do you travel to various fun places to collect the soil? And what is your favorite soil to work with? Um, 
I don't really. Okay, so some soils, any soil from outside of the continental United States and south of the Mason-Dixon line is, uh, is considered regulated by the government. There can be dangerous things in soil like pathogens. Um, golden nematode is a famous example in New York State, right? So the soil that I use is something that is soil that comes into the lab. I know exactly where it came from and I know that it's safe to work with. I know that other, there are other soil artists and definitely other soil artists like don't think about sourcing and don't think about what might be living in their soil, but because I have a responsibility to my lab and I um, am responsible for adhering to the APHIS permit, I'm very uh, careful where I get my soil from. Well, there's a blend of art and science right there. Um, here's a question. Are your paintings very heavy and do you use any tools other than brushes to apply the soil paint? Yeah, they are not very heavy. Um, the big, I almost gave one of my colleagues a heart attack carrying around three sisters all over campus, photographing at different places and stuff. They're really not very heavy. I can carry a big one with one hand. And then, sorry, what was the other part of the question? Um, what do you, do you use any, anything besides brushes to apply the paint uh, to the canvas? Yeah, so that one painting, um, all the way in the beginning, the family portrait series of my mom in the bottom middle, that one I used a palette knife. And the, so two of the women who worked on the Three Sisters in Soil with me also used palette knives. You can do that. It's really important to build up the layers slowly. So any one of my paintings has five or six layers of soil. And it really doesn't look good until, to me, until you have this like uh, depth. So, yeah. Great, and um, where in New Jersey does the black soil come from? And I wonder if some of this information is on your website. Yeah, um, you can definitely, if you want to learn a lot more about what I do, you should watch Summer Rain Oaks video um, about my work. It's only, it's about nine minutes. I don't remember the name of the town that that muck soil came from. It was actually a gift for me from the guy who commissioned the Moravian um, seal painting and he brought me like five gallons of it. He just had a friend, I believe she was an onion farmer. Um, a lot of onions are grown in muck soil as you guys might know. Um, and he just collected it, but you can find muck soil all over the place. But I wouldn't, like personally, I wouldn't go digging up muck soil for me to paint with because muck soil is really important carbon sink and it's really important to actually leave it where it is. So I don't, I don't approve of people like going and digging up kind of like rare soils for this, just to, just to say. That's, that's great. That's great. Well, thank you, Kirsten, for sharing your art and your passion with, with us this evening. It's really evident that you love what you do and it's great to see science and art blended into one beautiful option. It's, it's gorgeous. Thank you very thank much. You We're going to go forward now and at the core of Art at BTI is the focus at the intersection of art and science and I'm honored to introduce BTI faculty Dr. Maria Harrison to highlight how soil and what lives in it, what lives in it can be celebrated. Okay, um, I have to share screen. Are you able to see my screen? Yeah. Great. Okay, well, thank you, Ali, um, for setting this up and for the opportunity to participate. And I'm going to, as Ali said, um, continue on the theme of things in soil, but changing from um, the soil itself and, and beautiful art to, uh, interactions in the soil and how um, organisms uh, live in the soil, particularly plants, and interact with other organisms to get the essential mineral nutrients that they need from the soil. And so this title, um, for those that are not familiar with this, this acronym, um, this is a short version for, for inorganic phosphate. So I will tell you a little bit about an association that forms between plant roots and certain species of fungi and the work that I'll talk about it, it's I'm talking in generalities some things that I talk about we've discovered and others have been discovered by uh, colleagues in our field 
and you'll see a fair number of references on the slides and, and those are referring to um, the papers or the original articles from which these data arose. So let's start off with, with roots. Um, I think everybody knows what roots look like. But if you um, zoom in a little with a, a low power binocular microscope and look more closely, you can see the root here. You can also maybe see small hairs on the edges of the roots. You can also see something else that's extending uh, distant from the roots, fine strands. And this is a fungus and these strands are, are called hyphae. You can see that they don't have color. So if you stain the roots and again increase magnification, can have a look at this more closely. And so we stained with a pink stain here that stains the fungal cell walls. And what you're seeing here, which is slightly out of focus, are the equivalent strands that you were looking at here. But what you can see in addition is a lot of pink staining inside the root, actually inside the root cells. So this is the root and you can see all the individual root cells here. And all of this pink fuzzy stuff that you're seeing in the middle is fungus. So quite a lot of it. Now, again, um, it's difficult to tell what these things inside the cells are, but if you, again, increase magnification, um, going to a, a confocal microscope or a scanning electron microscope, then these structures inside the cell will look like this. So you can see a, a kind of, some people think they look like trees um, with a trunk and branches, but a very branched uh, structure. And this is also a hypha. It's just a branched type of hypha. Um, this one with the scanning EM, I think it looks like a coral. And so the, this is the fungus you're looking at inside the plant cell. And this is what all of these cells with this fuzzy pink stuff in, um, they all have these structures inside them. So there's a tremendous amount of uh, fungus inside the plant roots there. And I think um, people always ask me, well, really, is, that, is this um, beneficial for the plant? It looks as if it could be a hostile takeover. But actually, it's really not a hostile takeover. And the plant actively encourages the fungus to and grow into the root system and furthermore builds compartments for the, the fungus to live in. And so it does this uh, when plants are starving for phosphate, they send out signals into the soil. And one of the ones they send out that we know of is, is a, a molecule called strigalactone. Don't worry about the name. It's a fan fancy, interesting looking structure. And these molecules, um, the fungus can detect them and it causes the fungus uh, to increase its metabolism and, and to grow more vigorously. And so here you have a fungal spore that's germinated. And again, you can see the hyphae um, strands growing out of the spore. And growth here is stimulated because the fungus is detecting strigalactone close to the roots. Now, um, the fungus also secretes molecules that the plant can perceive. So the fungus puts out signal molecules, and this one's called lipokytooligosaccharide. It's a, a sugar with a lipid attached to it. And this molecule, also a complicated one, can be detected by the root cells. And when the root cells detect this molecule, it uh, triggers a, a signaling pathway in the cell and a change in the gene expression in the cell. And this changes the biology of the cell so that the fungus is actually able to grow into the root. And I'll show you this in a really nice animated model that was developed by a colleague um, from Italy, Andrea Genre, um, and published now more than 15 years ago. But I think it illustrates um, in, in model form how the fungus um, goes into the cell and also some of the changes that are occurring in the cell. So what you're going to see, this is the surface of the root. Um, this would be out in the soil. This is a root hair. And what you're going to see is a fungus coming in, a purple one coming in from the side here. So we'll see if this will play. Okay, here comes the fungus. So it's detected um, strigalactones. It's secreting its, its lipo, lipokytoligosaccharide. And now we've got changes occurring in the plant cell because the plant cell detected that molecule. And the organelles inside the cell um, move. So that was the nucleus moving close to the fungus, but other organelles move as well. So organelles are kind of machinery of the cell. And what these um, machinery are doing is building a membrane tunnel that's spanning the cell and the membrane you can see in the background is this yellow part. So the plant has built a membrane tunnel and now the fungus grows through the plant inside this membrane tunnel and this allows it to grow across the plant cell and you can see it now going down the tunnel. And well in the cartoon it comes out the other side. Um, what would really happen, well it probably would come out the other side but um, it would continue to grow potentially through other cells in the root. 
And the signaling continues um, with these molecules, but probably also with other molecules that we're unaware of at the moment. And those kinds of changes, this membrane building, is occurring in all of these, these cells in the root system as the fungus grows along and grows into the roots. Even in these cells where the fungus makes this tremendously branched structure, it's no problem for the plant. It builds a membrane that covers the whole of that structure. And actually it fits so closely like a glove that you can actually see the fungus if you label the plant membrane, which we're able to do by labeling proteins that are in the plant membrane. And so in this image, you, you see the, the fungal structure inside the cell, this branch structure. It's not because we've stained the fungus. This is actually a live cell. We're live imaging here. And we're seeing the membrane around the fungus because of a labeled protein that's in the membrane. It's actually a phosphate transporter protein. I'll mention a little more later on. So a tremendous amount of, of um, signaling and changes that go on in order to have these organisms live together, starting off with complex signaling, <coughs> excuse me, and ending with the cell, the plant cell, building a compartment in which the fungus lives. So um, in these cells with these branch structures, the fungus is not exiting. It just comes in, makes the branch structure and stays inside the cell in its little membrane bound compartment. So why do they, why do, they do this? Why is this such this intricate and very energetically expensive activity going on? And this is um, allowing them to live in close association for prolonged periods of time. And the benefit um, to each organism, to both the plant and the fungus, is that they each get something that otherwise they would find very difficult to obtain or maybe impossible to obtain. Um, for the fungus, it's obtaining carbon from the plant. And these fungi have no ability to break down um, complex carbon sources in the soil. They have to be fed carbon by the plant. And the form that the plant feeds to them uh, is both lipids and sugars. Um, the plant is getting help with phosphate acquisition. So plants can obviously take up phosphate from the soil by themselves, but these hyphae are also particularly good at accessing phosphate. And what happens out here is that these hyphae take up phosphate. It moves back through these hyphae. They're like little pipelines. They're ultimately connected to the interior structures inside the root cell, so these branch structures. And basically the phosphate's transported um, into these cells, into the fungus inside the cell, and then released from the fungus. And then the plant has a way to take it across that membrane um, that's around the fungus and bring it into the plant cell. So the plant is getting a, a second mechanism for getting phosphate, which um, supplements its own root systems. And um, you might ask, well, is, is this really necessary? Because um, it's also costly for the plant to feed the fungus. The plant is expending maybe up to 20% of its carbon that it's, it's fixed by photosynthesis in its leaves. It's sending up to 20% of that to the roots to feed this fungus. Um, so is there really such a, a benefit to having uh, these fungi in the roots? And the answer is yes. And, and the reason is um, actually has multiple parts to it. The first reason that it's beneficial is that plants actually need a tremendous amount of phosphorus, um, which they acquire as phosphate. So the phosphorus content of, of leaves um, is very high. 0.2% of, of the dry weight of every leaf, that's one five hundredth, is phosphorus. And when you look at a picture like this, which is the Cornell Botanic Gardens, and all this growth, all of this leaf growth, one five hundredth of that is phosphorus, which the plants uh, extracted from the soil. So it's a tremendous amount. And this all came in the last couple of months, so also very fast. The other reason that um, it's beneficial to have a fungal symbiont to help you get phosphate is that it's difficult to get from the soil. So phosphorus exists in many forms, um, always as phosphates in, in terrestrial and biological systems, um, but in complexes with other, other uh, elements. So particularly with iron, aluminium, calcium, magnesium, and these are sparingly soluble. So you can see there's a lot of um, phosphate, PO3, uh, PO4 here. Um, but it's very difficult for, for anybody to get it out of these particular molecules. They're very insoluble. Also organic um, components with a lot of phosphate in them, but uh, equally difficult to get the phosphates out. And so as a result of this, um, and also the fact that phosphate binds very well to things like clay, means that there's very low amounts of the form that's available to the plant in the soil, and plants rapidly take this up. 
which results in a, a zone around the root which is depleted for phosphate. And it's very slow for more phosphate to move back into this zone. So you can see from this diagram that if you have a fungus in your roots, um, those fungal hyphae can potentially span this zone and go out to mine additional um, soil volume that the root wouldn't get to. And another factor that makes the fungi um, good at this is that their, uh, their hyphae are much finer than the root. You can see that here, this is a sorghum root. Um, and then therefore they can get into small pores, small pockets in the soil um, much more efficiently, or actually parts of the soil that the root would never get into because it's too big. And to give you an idea of the scale of the hyphae, I took an image of uh, one of those hyphae I stained with a green stain um, adjacent to a human hair. So you can see that these hyphae are extremely fine, maybe, maybe a tenth of the diameter of a human hair. Um, so with a lot of, of fine hyphae in the soil, you have the capacity to, light, to mine a lot more phosphate from the soil. And then there's another factor, which is that these extra external hyphae out in the soil um, are covered in, in bacteria from the soil. So they have their own little microbiome. And many of these bacteria are very good at solubilizing um, phosphate out of those complex forms. And that means that solubilization goes on very close to the hypha and the hypha has a chance to catch some of that phosphate. So all this um, generally then results in increased growth for the plant when you have one of these symbionts in the root, particularly if you're growing in one of these difficult soils, a soil with a low amount of, of available uh, phosphorus. And so what you're looking at here are sorghum plants in the BTI greenhouse, and these three on the left um, don't have any fungus in the pot. And all of these ones over here have different species of, of fungi, and you can see they're much larger than the, the controls that didn't get any uh, fungus. So I managed to go for hmm, about 10 slides without telling you the name of this association. And I did that on purpose because it seems to, the name seems to have a, a soporific effect on people. The name is Mycorrhiza. Um, and this literally means fungus root, um, mics for fungus, mushroom, this is from Greek, and rhiza for root. And this, so Mycorrhiza is the name of the association, the two things together. So you'll hear people talk about mycorrhizal associations or mycorrhizal symbiosis, and this is what they're referring to. And there are a number of different types depending on um, the fungus or the plant species, well, both the fungus and the plant species that are involved in the association. And um, the one that I've been discussing um, down here, you can guess that it has an even more complicated name. And this one's called Arbuscular Mycorrhizal Symbiosis. And that's because of these structures inside the root cells that the fungus makes. These are called arbuscules. And this is from the Latin for little tree. And so they're called tree-like hypha. So this is an arbuscular mycorrhizal association. And uh, you can probably guess that the fungi that form these associations are called arbuscular mycorrhizal fungi, which we tend to um, reduce in the lab to AM fungi or AMF. And what you're looking at here on the image uh, are, are images of the spores of these fungi. This is the only part of the fungus or form of the fungus that you can have separated from the plant and, and that's still living. Um, they're full of lipid and, and they have very thick walls. And this is a resting phase. It allows the fungus to survive in the soil when there's no plant roots around. Some of them are very large. This species down here, which is called Gigospora gigantea, um, have spores that are half a millimeter in diameter, which is something that you can see with the naked eye. Um, you don't need a microscope to see them. And we've known, I think, yeah, really for a long time that they're obligate symbionts, that they're unable to grow and obtain carbon. But it's really only in the last few years um, that it was known that they needed to get their lipid from the plant. And that one of the reasons that they're obligate symbionts is that they have no capacity to synthesize fatty acids, um, de novo, fatty acids from, from single carbon molecules. They need to get um, that fat from the plant. And this was discovered as a consequence of the genomes of these fungi being sequenced. Um, the first genome was sequenced um, yeah, about seven or eight years ago. And um, work from a group in Germany, Peter Dermann's group, um, looked at the sequence and, and noticed immediately that the fungus appeared not to have an enzyme that most other um, organisms have, uh, an enzyme called FAS. 
uh, fatty acid synthase complex. And so this has turned out now to be true in all the fungi that have been sequenced. We recently um, sequenced Glomus versiformi, um, which is one of our favorite fungi, and we did that in collaboration with Sang Jung Fei's lab at, at BTI. And uh, this also has no fatty acid synthase. So we think now generally that the reason these fungi are obligate symbionts is not only that they can't break down carbon, but they also can't synthesize um, fatty acids by themselves. The, I should have pointed to this up here. So for anybody who's an aficionado of, of fungal um, taxonomy, these fungi are in the phylum Mucromycota and the subphylum Glomeromycotina. And if you know fungi at all, you probably know that this is an early diverging lineage of fungi. So they're extremely old. And the association that they form with plants is also extremely old. They've been associated with plants for over 400 million years. And there's very nice fossil evidence to show this. So these images over here on the left are, um, they look like the ancestral arbuscules and hyphae inside cells. And these are actually images of the polished face of rocks. Um, so fossil rocks that have been polished and, and then viewed under a microscope and, and imaged. And these came from uh, the late Professor Tom Taylor at Kansas University, um, who made some beautiful studies of, of the, uh, the fossils of these fungi. And these are in a um, now extinct plant called like Agliophyton, which uh, artist rendition looks something like this, and was one of the earliest land plants. And it's speculated that these fungi were very important in allowing these very early land plants to really colonize terrestrial environments. So the terrestrial environment at this time was very harsh and this aglyphyton has very bad um, sort of pseudo roots. They're not even real roots. So you can imagine that it was particularly difficult to extract things from the soil. And it's proposed that these ancestral AM fungi and possibly other ancestral fungi that were around at the time allowed plants to, to colonize land. And so now after, that was 400 million years ago, and these associations have been retained um, really in the majority of the flowering plant species. So now that over 72%, that was the current estimate, of plants, plant species, flowering plant species, are capable of forming these associations with um, AM fungi. So there's obviously a benefit um, if it's going to be retained through so many years of evolution it must have continually, continually provided some selective advantage uh, to the plant. This is another picture from the botanic gardens with many, many plants here that form um, symbioses with AM fungi. So in the last, I'll just do a few slides, last few slides, um, looking a little at, at our research interests. I don't want to go into a lot of data, but I thought I would tell you what we've been interested in and give one, um, and give you one sort of example of how we approach this and some of the um, things that we've learned. So these two um, plant species here are the plants that we use uh, to study the symbiosis mostly in the lab. They're um, convenient models because they're small, can grow easily in the growth chambers, and there's a lot of genetics and genomics resources available for them. So they're useful model systems and they're closely related to important crops. So this is Medicago truncatula, it's a small legume, it's a relative of alfalfa, but it also serves as a model for other legumes. And this is Brachypodium distachyon, it's a small grass plant related to wheat and also useful for model for other grasses. And what we're trying to do with these organisms and a range of AM fungi that I haven't shown on this slide, but were on the earlier slide, what we're trying to do is understand at the molecular level, how does this association develop? So if I just put in the screenshot from the earlier slide that I have, really what we'd like to know is what genes in the plant control the ability of the fungus to um, transduce these signals? What kind of changes in gene expression um, do they elicit? And then the encoded proteins from those genes, what do they do and how do they allow the plant to, for example, build a membrane tunnel or build a membrane around the fungus? Um, we're also interested in knowing how nutrients are exchanged across these interfaces. How does the um, plant get the, ph the phosphate from the fungus? How does the plant cell change its metabolism in order to feed lipid um, to this microorganism inside its roots? So those are the sorts of, of things that are, are general questions uh, in the lab. And also um, we're interested in, in the diversity of, of function among AM symbioses. 
So we approach this mostly um, through a combination of genetics and genomics approaches, some cell biology, um, some imaging, some plant physiology. And I'll just give you one, one example um, from one of the questions that we asked, um, which was how does the root cell obtain phosphate from the fungus? I'll give you one example of the approach and also what we were able to learn about the association by studying um, this particular gene. So the question is um, phosphate, as I've already said, comes out of the fungus here, but the fungus is surrounded in the membrane and this is shown in a diagram here. So the dotted line is the membrane, which means that when the phosphate first leaves the fungus, it's in this space that's shown here in blue. The plant cell doesn't have it yet. And in order to get it into the plant cell, the plant needs to have some kind of protein in this membrane to transport it into the, into the plant cell because the phosphate cannot simply diffuse through the membrane barrier. So we looked for these um, with, based on, on sequence analyses. We had cloned some many years ago, so we have some clues as to what their sequences should look like. And um, this one was going to be a little bit different, but we were able to um, use sequence-based approaches to find it. And basically what these proteins are like, this is just a, a diagram to show you um, conceptually what they're like. They're proteins that span the membrane. They have some kind of a, a channel in the middle of them or a pore in the middle of them um, that's selective and is able to move phosphate from one side of the membrane to the other. So the one we, we obtained um, is capable of selectively moving phosphate from one side of the membrane to the other. And actually the um, protein is the one that I showed you earlier giving the green uh, stain to the membrane that's around the fungus. So that protein, we know it's in the right membrane. It's in this membrane that's around the fungus. And then to ask questions about its, its function in the symbiosis, we create a, a Medicago truncatula uh, mutant plant in which that gene is inactivated, that phosphate transporter gene is inactive. And the plant grows perfectly well um, if you grow it in, in good soil. So these are two plants, Medicago plants, with their phosphate transporter gene inactivated, so they're mutants, and this is the normal, or what we call the wild type plant. If you uh, inoculate these plants, put them in a, a low phosphorus containing soil and inoculate them with AM fungi, then you start to see the difference between the mutants and the wild type, and this is shown here on, on the graph. So if you look at this left graph first, the um, plants that are in the darker color um, these are the, the control plants, the wild type plants, are growing here without fungus, this darker color, and with fungus, the, the lighter shading. And you can see that there's an increase in growth in those wild type plants when they have fungus in the roots. And there's also an increase in phosphorus content of the shoots in those plants. But the red plants, which are over here, are the phosphate transporter mutants, show no increase in growth um, before without fungus or with fungus and without fungus, is that the right way around? Yeah, without fungus and, and with fungus. So we knew from these experiments that we have actually blocked the transport of phosphate into the cell. Um, so that told us we, we identified the right phosphate transporter. And we were able to do other experiments um, using radio labeled radioisotopes, phosphate isotopes, to really show that the fungus is unable to deliver its phosphate to the plant in this plant mutant. So that raised, uh, after, after finding the right gene, it allowed us to ask the question, what happens to an association if the plant doesn't get any phosphate from its, its fungus? Does the fungus become parasitic and take over and um, cause problems? Actually, it's quite the converse. In fact, the fungus suffers terribly in these mutant roots. Uh, it's able to start to grow into the root, just as I showed you earlier. It starts to make these branch structures, the, the arbuscules. Um, but what happens in the mutant plant is that they shrivel up and die very quickly. So the fungus is unable to live for a very long period of time in this mutant and it can't make spores, it can't complete its life cycle. And the levy, level of living hyphae, living fungus, in this uh, phosphate transporter mutant is very low compared to the level in the wild type. So what these and, and additional experiments showed us was that, that um, delivery of phosphate from the fungus to the plant cell is very important to allow the fungus to be maintained and if you don't have that um, the fungus fungus dies off so essentially there's a coupling between um, delivering phosphate and, and and survival of the fungus which puts a which, which provides a level of regulation for the plant um, basically the plant is able to uh, somehow determine 
um, whether or not phosphate is coming in. And then we, we believe that it probably cuts off the lipid supply to the fungus. We don't think it's actively killing it by some mechanism, but rather starving it out. And of course, this was done in a mutant. Um, this, these analyses are done in a mutant background where we purposely blocked that phosphate um, flow by making a mutant. But you can imagine in, in a situation um, in a plant that's, that's totally functional, that there would be cases where in some times uh, fungus wouldn't deliver phosphate, maybe because it's hyphae out in the soil, just there's no phosphate around. So the part that it's connected to inside um, would not be delivering phosphate. And this mechanism would allow the plant then to stop um, supporting this particular fungus and continue to support those that are delivering uh, phosphate to the roots. So basically it, the, the transporter and the coupling um, with, with some survival mechanism, that's some probably lipid transport mechanism um, that we're still trying to determine is a way that there's, there's a functional checkpoint for the plant. And a way that I think the symbiosis has been able to maintain some level of balance um, through its 400 million years of, of evolution. So I think this is obviously particularly important for the plant because it's going to sink a lot of carbon uh, into feeding uh, the symbiont. So it's, it's not effective to feed an inefficient symbiont. So these are some of the um, types of approaches we take, some of the questions, um, one of the questions that, that we're interested in asking. Um, I think uh, understanding the basis of how the association develops, how it's regulated, um, how it functions, um, will allow us also to try to understand some of the variability in the growth responses that we see promoted by different AM fungi. So what you're seeing here is a very complicated graph and don't, don't look at all of it, but it's basically a lot of different sorghum accessions um, that have been not inoculated with anything, those are the red bars, or inoculated with different fungi. That's what the different colors are, the um, green, gray, and yellow. And then the green, oh no, sorry, blue, purple, and yellow. And then the gray and the green at the end are combinations. And so what you can see here is that um, for this particular accession, the three fungi here, yellow, purple, gray, purple, and blue, are capable of promoting uh, good growth of this accession, whereas the combinations, as soon as you put two of these in combination, actually there's no growth promotion, there's some kind of antagonistic effect. And over here, in the same soil, and the only difference is the accession of, of the sorghum, so different genotype of sorghum, you can see that all the fungi and the combinations all promote growth of this particular uh, sorghum accession. And there are, through this graph, many other different combinations. It's just um, too complicated to look at them all. But basically, uh, the message is that the plant growth response varies with the plant genotype, the species of fungus, and also with the soil environment, which is actually not shown here. We kept the soil constant in this experiment. And we'd like to understand the basis of this, which is obviously has um, applications uh, in agriculture, and we'd um, like to get to the basis of this, and I think understanding something about how the association develops and functions, regulates, is regulated, will allow us to get there. So that brings me to the last couple of slides, which just address um, some questions about why is this research useful anyway? What, what good is it to study AM fungi and their association with plants? And I think it's probably relatively easy to, to uh, realize that they have potential application in, in agriculture. So to get good crop yields, you need fertile soil and a large proportion of the world's soils are considered deficient for phosphorus, either because it's fixed, because it's not available or because they really have very little there that degraded soils. And this, um, I think it's about 70% of the arable agricultural soils are considered deficient and can't support full crop growth. But this is um, relatively easy to fix, at least in, in places where there's um, money to do so, and that can be fixed by applying phosphate fertilizer. So these are examples of, of non-fertilized and fertilized parts of, of poor soils um, with wheat and maize. And the world applies something like over 40 million metric tons of phosphate fertilizers a year, phosphorus containing fertilizers a year, to get the crop yields that we need to support um, support humans throughout the world, well not throughout the world unfortunately, many many people can't afford um, this level of phosphate fertilization. But there's economic costs and then there's also um, environmental costs. So these are some 
um, data or images and data from the NOAA um, website. If you look at the um, Mississippi and also Atchafalaya um, rivers, this is the watershed um, which goes through much of the um, agricultural land in the US. And they measure the discharge um, from these rivers and measure the nutrient content to see how much runoff, fertilizer runoff problems are occurring. And the current data for May 2020, um, there was particularly high discharge because there was a lot of rain um, within this region and 21,400 metric tons of phosphorus went down the river, um, which is um, more than normal and more than the average for the year. And this is just actually in one month. And this ends up in the Gulf of Mexico um, down here and causes these algal blooms, which later lead to a dead zone um, in the Gulf. And so this is just one example of, of the problem of, of uh, phosphate fertilizer runoff. It's not only phosphate actually, it's also nitrate, but, but fertilizer runoff in general. And these are um, resources that we actually can't afford to lose because the phosphorus based fertilizers are actually a finite resource. They're mined from rock phosphate that comes out of the earth and turned into to phosphate fertilizer. And it's predicted um, that the rate of consumption at the moment would lead to the depletion of these reserves, at least the easily accessible ones, within somewhere, depending on whose estimates you look at, between 90 and 200 years. So it's important for agriculture to become more efficient in, in the application and use of phosphorus fertilizers and um, to try to avoid these runoff issues and pollution issues. And I think that understanding and using um, these microbial associates in the soil um, will be one part of that solution. It's certainly not going to solve the whole thing. There's going to be need for other kinds of recycling and, and um, controlled application, but I think that, that the uh, microorganisms can definitely play a part. So I'm going to stop there and I'd like to show you the members of my lab. Um, currently, this is unfortunately how we look. We're all distant, we wear masks and they're giving you the tough guy, we can, we can work even when there's a virus look. Um, but if we go back to this picture a couple of years ago, you can see uh, smiling faces and the whole faces um, from people, students and, and postdocs in the lab. We have many collaborators, both at BTI and um, uh, in other parts of the world that we've worked with on different projects and we're funded by um, federal funding. Also Triad Foundation has been very generous to us and the postdocs are very talented and have obtained some of their own funding to support their salaries from the Swiss National Science Foundation. Um, the DFG in Germany and Marie Curie. And of course our lab doesn't work in isolation, so the um, support that we obtain from BTI is also really um, great and, and we really uh, appreciate that. So we have great greenhouse facilities, we have a facilities and mechanical shop that helps us with many things, we have purchasing people, um, we have lab services so we don't have to do our own dishwashing, greatly appreciated. And we have business office that helps with all the accounting kinds of things, communications who sets up these types of activities and also some um, different facilities that we use for research. So we're very lucky at BTI and, and grateful to the teams that support the research in the labs. And I just want to end with a thank you and to say that if you do go out into the woods or into your garden and you pull something up, these were ramps that I collected in Ithaca this April, and then you stain the roots, you can see that they really have mycorrhizal fungi, AM fungi in their root systems. So thank you very much for listening and I'd be happy to answer questions. Thanks, Maria. Wow, this is amazing that, it, that you'd think a simple root or the soil has, it's just so intense. So that's, that's very um, enlightening. We do have one question. Are mycorrhizia, mycorrhizia present in all soils? Yes, they're present in all terrestrial um, ecosystems on the earth. And another question of how did you land on this particular uh, focus of your research? How did, what was your journey on this particular um, yeah. final spot? Yeah, so I was a um, microbiology undergraduate and plant biochemistry, plant molecular biology um, PhD. And then I went to work as a postdoc on working on plant microbe interactions, but it was actually plant pathogen interactions and studied that. And um, 
was was learn, learned about mycorrhizal symbiosis from um, some lectures that I heard um, in Guelph, actually in Canada, from Larry Peterson. And I was TAing. It was a course, and I was TAing a, a part of that course, but listening to the lectures, and was fascinated by these images of fungi inside the root systems and and the ex, this extensive um, growth within the root, and just became curious how how could these fungi, how could the plant support this when most of my research was um, focused on how plants kill off things that try to get into their, their uh, root systems or cells. And that sort of sparked, I think that sparked my interest and I started to decide that later when I would have my own lab, I would work on those. That's great. I'm glad that you're working on those. A question has come in. How do we incorporate AM in our soils, gardens, and forests? Yeah, you don't, they are actually there, which is um, why I put that picture of the ramps up um, because if you, if you look in the soil, they're already there. Um, of course, you can um, try to manage the soil to encourage them to be there. Um, the typical organic sort of management will, will encourage um, the populations. The things that discourage the populations would be putting on a very high amount of phosphate fertilizer, um, but you don't, you don't need to necessarily add them. If you're in a, maybe if you're in a, a very poor soil, you may find very few, um, you could add them. Um, there are inoculants available, um, although I'm not sure how great they really work. Um, you can always give it a go, but really you don't need to add them. They're there. Great. Here's another question. Any evidence of lipid transporters eat from either the plant or fungi or expressed on or near the internal membrane? Yes. Yeah, so the, um, the lipid, we, we found a, a transporter a long time ago. Um, that's essential for survival of the fungus. This was before we ever knew anything about the fungus requiring lipid. And that transporter is in a family of transporters of which many members transport lipids. And so now we believe that that transporter is the way that, that lipid is transported to the fungus. It's just a very difficult thing to show directly because you can't label and show the transport through that transporter. So we've not shown it directly, but all the indirect evidence would say that that's the transporter that transports lipid to the fungus. It's a transporter called that we called STAR for stunted arbuscule because that was the um, phenotype of the of the mutant. The, the fungus just couldn't grow. Great, and I think we have one more question here. So the fungus doesn't actually penetrate the cytoplasm of the cell. Correct. It's held out. It's it's surrounded by that membrane, kept in its own little membrane compartment in the cell that the plant builds. So it's um, keeping the fungus, it's allowing the fungus to live inside the cell, but it's also keeping it distant um, by having a membrane around it. Great. Sounds like COVID. <laughs> Everything sounds like COVID. Well, I wanna thank Maria and thanks to Kirsten for giving us plenty of reasons to, to celebrate soil on this National Healthy so uh, Soil Health Day and also, two perspectives of why it's really important to be really mindful of the soil that we have and really protect it and be conservation um, wise. I wanna thank, thank all of our participants who have um, who've attended, thanks for your time. I wanna thank those who made a donation in association with this event. Um, your donation enables scientific research at BTI and we're so appreciative of your support. I would love to announce that Warren Zipfel is the winner of the raffle of the piece of art from Kirsten Kurtz. And I'll be reaching out to Warren shortly to figure out how to get that to you in this world of COVID. I would also love to thank our sponsor, Q The Landscape, again, for supporting Art of BTI for years. And that support is very important to all of us. And I would like to engage all of you in a new program that we have called Breaking Ground Discussion Series. This, it's a brand new um, virtual program related to um, what we're doing in our labs. And this Thursday, this Tuesday, June 20th, excuse me, on, on June 30th, Tuesday, June 30th, we were going, featuring an interactive chat with Dr. Joyce Fenneck. You can go to btiscience.org for more information and we have the link put into the chat for you to see that's a new series and we're hoping that you'll be able to participate in that new series for, um, it's a good way to connect with what's going on at BTI. So with that, I would love to thank all of you for your time, for your support. Have a wonderful evening and be well.
Thank you. Thanks, Ali.